Hello and welcome to the Brave New Weed podcast. And now here's your host, Joe Dolce. This is our 420 episode, which is significant because it's also our first year anniversary of doing the Brave New Weed podcast. Congratulations, Matthew. Congratulations to you, Joe. This is all stemming out of the creation of your book and everything to follow. And now one year after celebrating the launch of the podcast on 420, we're, we're still here. We're still here. We're still doing it. We're still having conversations <laughs> for the post-prohibitionist era. Thanks for joining us. We have a really interesting show tonight, but first, I want to talk about something really important that we can all do. If we if you listen to this podcast anytime before April 23rd, I want you to think about contributing to the World Health Organization survey. They're trying to ask, should cannabis be descheduled? Should it be taken out of Schedule 1? This is a crucial and important thing for all of us to do. And there's a way to do it, actually. If you go on to normal.org, it's N-O-R-M-L dot org, forward slash act, you will see a petition that you can sign which is basically asking for comment as to why you think cannabis should be descheduled. Do you, Matthew, understand what the Schedule One status does to cannabis? Uh, well, uh, internationally, I'm not sure. I know how it affects what goes on here inside the United States and how the laws are based around the Controlled Substances yeah, Act. Yeah, we, the United States, created this thing called Schedule One, which basically designates very dangerous, addictive substances that have no medical use. Now, believe it or not, cannabis is in this category, as is LSD, which I think is also wrongly in this category, but that's another story for another podcast, okay? And this is one of the reasons that countries have enforced cannabis legal uh, uh, cannabis prohibition. It's because they don't want to break all the covenants that all of these countries have signed to keep the drug illegal, to keep the drug free from research, to keep the drug out of people's hands. Schedule one is one of the main components of this. So the World Health Organization actually doing a worldwide survey about people's opinions. I've written in, I, I highly recommend you write in. Oh, I put It'll in It'll take mine. five minutes. You don't have to be a scholar. You can talk about why you think cannabis it's a tra- that it's a travesty that it is in Schedule 1. Again, the URL is normal, N-O-R-M-L, dot org, forward slash act. And I just think anybody who listens to this podcast should at least be spiritually, if not practically, motivated to do this. Yeah, we've discussed this once before, uh, actually at one of our live events when we had uh, Dr. Chen with us. And, uh, you know, the actual URL uh, to submit to the FDA is quite long, but you can do that if you want to write your own letter. Normal has done a great thing by putting together this form, uh, structures a form letter, sends it out for you, and you basically just sign it with your own little modifications. Uh, it's a great way to access it, uh, but you got to hurry. Like I said, the deadline is the 23rd. So if you don't get there before the 23rd, your voice won't be heard. So stand Let's up. Let's make our voices counted. heard. You can find Brave New Weed on all the popular social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Brave New Weed. What else is in the news that you saw? You see this thing about John Boehner. Oh. <laughs> Come on. So <laughs> tell me what you saw. Well, it just goes to prove, right, that um, it's not about the drug at all. It's about the money. Because Mr. I'm ir- irrevocably opposed, Mr. John Boehner, uh, that highly <laughs> principled ex speaker of the House, has now changed his mind and has joined the advisory board of a very large marijuana producer called Acreage. Is that what Acreage, called? Acreage? Yeah. Let me pull up the article real quick. And but didn't John Boehner once say he would never have anything to do with cannabis? Uh, yeah, the quote literally was irrevocably opposed. And that was, what, 10 years ago? That was nine years ago he stated that. And now he sits on the board of Acreage Holdings, uh, a company that cultivates, processes, and distributes cannabis in 11 states. And they hold something like 35 licenses for cannabis businesses inside the United States. But maybe maybe it's a good thing. Maybe the hypocrisy is a good thing. Maybe he'll be able to lobby some other stuck in the mud Republicans and Democrats to change change things. So do you think this could be a good thing? Well, 
Yes uh, hypocrisy no. aside. Yeah, hypocrisy, hypocrisy aside. Okay. Sure. So what Let's we have here is here. a very prominent Republican former congressman who is very tanned prominent <laughs> Republican <laughs> who former tends to cry a lot, but uh, who has now sh- jumped ship from his you know strong stout conservative holdings to to make money basically in the world of cannabis. So I think it signals two things: one, that the rhetoric is all just BS from the start. That that what well, these, we know they, that they they don't even believe what they're saying about this being the the demon drug that's going to get you, uh, and two that the forecast of the ability to make money in this industry have to be so much bigger than any of us actually understand. We we know this for a fact. Let's hope it can do some bit of good. There's a couple other people involved. Uh, former Massachusetts Governor William Weld is also on the board, uh, joining Boehner as a Republican who is saying, yep, I'm going to switch sides on this issue. And uh, who, who knows how it's going to turn out? I mean, there's a lot of advocacy coming out, and uh, obviously the media is going wild that this has been announced publicly. They're making a big deal out of it. So apparently they think that they can use this name and or these two names to sort of sway the conversation in their favor. Who knows? Maybe this is a domino effect that starts to get Republicans to jump sides. Let's switch, let's switch that topic to our own state of New York, where Cynthia Nixon, who is now running for governor, has come out, I love that, who's come out in a pro-cannabis legalization sense. I mean, again, it's hardly a radical position. Right, and it just seems to be the norm, and that that's you know it speaks to the other story as well that we're mainstreaming this conversation now. Everybody's talking about it, and it's something that if you're in the world of politics, uh, you have to talk about. And I think we're seeing that with this. I don't know if Cynthia Nixon necessarily belongs in the world of politics. I don't know anything about her. We're not talking. We're not talking about her, her judgment here. We're just talking about the fact that she's a voice of reality, it seems, against our own governor, Andrew Cuomo, who seems to have his head stuck somewhere in the sand, somewhere around 1950. Well, sure. And and I think you have, you know, there's sort of these prerequisite set of questions if you're going to get into to politics at all. It's like everybody wants to know where you stand on the hot button issues, abortion, you know, where do you stand on the issues has always been the thing. And now that one of the first things to come out is where do you stand on the legalization of marijuana? Yeah, it's a shift. Like, Definite, That's definitely a sea change. Definitely a sea change. So I want to interview Cynthia Nixon. Actually, I wouldn't even mind interviewing John Boehner and William Well. So if Let's any of our all. listeners, any of you guys out there have a contact to these folks, please let us know. I've written a million letters to Cynthia Nixon's campaign, have never once had the um, had a response. I haven't written to John Boehner yet, but I wouldn't mind. I'm very curious to hear how they've changed their minds or how they've come to their positions. So this is straight off of Cynthia Nixon's Twitter Feed. And apropos of uh, our of, of our yeah uh, of the, our one year anniversary, it, it's, she she's just tweeted out. Well, and as we're recording this, tweeted out. I don't know how we exactly do that. Uh, recently, she's recently even tweeted out uh, the following: A lot of people have been donating exactly four dollars and twenty cents. Apt being that it's four twenty. I got it. I got episode. it. Uh, <laughs> since we announced our plan, our plan to legalize weed in New York. So I missed that part. I knew that she was behind it. Yes. Uh, but we don't know what the plan is. Formally yet. has a plan to legalize it in New York. Yeah. Well, you have uh, to convince the New York state Senate, but I mean, let's not even go there. That's but, a whole but other it's story. interesting to see her brand, uh, on Twitter, her, her blue check Mark, uh, not only discussing it, but leaning in as a, as a tenant of her governorship campaign, they're going to the to the state house and they're going to legalize cannabis. Go, Cynthia, go. But you better get on there and donate your four dollars and twenty cents. I'm going to. It's the first time I've ever <laughs> donated to a Nixon. You know, we're growing and we're growing quickly. And one of the ways we're growing is when people share our podcast with people they think might be interested in it. So we want to encourage you. To hit that share button and send an episode to somebody you think will find it of interest. I'd like to welcome to this night's show uh, Dr. Amanda Ryman. Amanda is a doctor, but she's a social policy expert. Her expertise is in how to get laws changed. I met her when she was running the California chapter of the Drug Policy Alliance. Today, Amanda has really switched gears. She now runs community outreach at an organization called Flocana, a super interesting organization, by the way, of farmers based in Northern California who grow organic, sun-grown cannabis. 
And this organization brings that cannabis into the homes of prospective buyers. They educate the people about the value of sun-grown cannabis. They talk about their heritage seeds. They talk about the varieties and the different effects they create. Sort of like a Tupperware party for the modern era in California. So Amanda does that, and she handles a lot of the community relations and really helps these farmers get their product to the right consumers, which is a fantastic thing. She, and Flocana did a really, interesting also, a really interesting thing this year. They created these beautiful gift boxes of different Flocana sun-grown organic strains and presented them to many of the celebrants at the Academy Awards, many of the stars. So I really want to know what the response was to this behind the, behind the scenes, and I'm really happy to welcome to the podcast, Amanda Ryman. Amanda, Dr. Amanda Ryman, so nice to talk to you again. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I was reminded of your incredible presence when I saw a tweet or an Instagram uh, the other day about wine pairings and cannabis. Would you give me a little uh, update? You were at South by Southwest and something stimulated you to write about this. Can you fill me in a little bit? Well, it was really interesting. Uh, you know, I was at South by Southwest, which was such an amazing conference. And I really encourage people to check it out at least once. But there was a panel um, that was entitled like the future of cannabis. And so it was these um, business futurists and forecasters and investors talking about what they thought was going to be the next big thing in cannabis. So of course, I was listening a little bit tongue in cheek, because a lot of the things they were talking about are things that people who have been involved in the cannabis community have really been batting around for years and years. Uh, very uh, long, especially from California, wine pairings and cannabis, not a new idea, right? Exactly. So you know, when I heard them say, Oh, you know what I think is going to be really big? <laughs> cannabis and wine pairings. And I was like, really? You know, that we have the weed and wine symposium here in California that's about to do their second iteration down in San Luis Obispo. And we actually have had quite a bit of crossover between the wine industry and the cannabis industry. Of course, in California, you have to keep the business entity separate. You can't produce the two products on the same premise. You can't sell them in the same place. But that doesn't mean that these two industries are not looking at ways to collaborate, including things like tours and other kinds of things where consumers are looking to both experience wine and experience cannabis and experience it in a beautiful setting. And I think that's one of the things that we're really seeing um, in terms of crossover is that the same individuals that enjoy spending a day out at a beautiful winery in the country and talking to the vintner and trying different varietals are the same folks that want to come to a beautiful cannabis farm up in the hills, spend the day tasting different strains and talking to the farmer about their process. So I think that the cannabis world and the, we the wine world are going to be very, very connected moving forward. One of the most fun things I did when I was uh, reporting my book was I sat with a, a wine educator and we tried to put uh, different names on the different tastes and smells uh, that came with with actually inhaling cannabis. It was actually, we were actually smoking flour. We were not vaporizing, and um, it was a real exercise. You know, it's really important. I thought I actually got out of it that it's quite important to try to name flavors to things that haven't been named previously. Do you find that? I think that that's true. And I also think it's important for us to recognize that there's a lot of smells and flavors in cannabis that we find in other things. And that cannabis is a plant. It's got the same smells and chemicals uh, that make a pine tree smell like a pine tree and an orange <laughs> tree smell like an orange tree. And there's a wonderful young woman in the Bay Area who calls herself the Herb Sommelier. And she <laughs> will actually go around and do cannabis and wine pairings looking for terpene profiles. So certain terpene profiles in cannabis match well with certain terpene profiles in wine. And so again, you know, we're discovering that there's this whole new world, but that part of that world is actually something we're already very familiar with. So have you done a lot of wine and cannabis pairings? It's not a combination that appeals to me on any level, by the way. Do you like it? 
I do like it, but I like it again in the right context. So I've been to some really great events up here in Northern California that are hosted on a winery property and they're passing hors d'oeuvres and they're having some wine tastings and then they have some cannabis available for tastings. And I feel that that's really the scenario rather than kind of like two fisting a joint and a glass of wine, you know, in your living room, which is also awesome, but doesn't necessarily (laughs) have the same artistic appeal as the experience that comes from actually going where the product is made. Um, One of the things in terms of public health that we like to talk about is that the order in which you use the substances actually makes a difference. And if you use cannabis, um, before wine, before alcohol, you can actually get away with using a lot less alcohol. So if you're someone that usually drinks two glasses of wine, smoke a little cannabis, and then maybe you're having half a glass of wine. But on the other end of the spectrum, if you've had a lot of alcohol, and then you consume cannabis, you're likely to have a bad outcome. Mm, so there's a whole is. art. Um, well, it has to do with a lot of things. I mean, one, cannabinoids and alcohol actually interact and have a synergistic effect. Yes. But alcohol, <laughs> uh, cannabis makes the alcohol that's already in your system more biologically available. Uh-huh. And so when you have a lot of alcohol in your system already, consuming cannabis is like making that alcohol stronger inside your system. And that's uh-huh. why sometimes people have a bad reaction. Uh, but the other way, you know, you can really use cannabis to reduce your alcohol intake. Interesting. So where are we talking? Where are you from? Where are you, where are you sitting right now? What part of beautiful California? I am in Redwood Valley, which is in central, south central Mendocino County. Um, about 15 minutes north of Ukiah, and I'm looking outside at a bunch of beautiful local birds and trees because I live in the country and I love it. Now, you are currently working at a cannabis distribution company that works with sun-grown farmers, in, right? And it's called Flocana, am I correct? That is correct. Um, so Flocana is a branded cannabis distribution company. We work um, with small sun-grown farmers in Mendocino and Southern Humboldt counties, and we have distribution hubs across the state. Uh, the goal of our company is to co-brand our product with our farmer So that if you're buying our product in San Diego, you can see what farm produced that product. And then you can go on our website and you can see a video of that farm. You can read about that farm. And sometimes we even bring the farmers to dispensaries across the state to talk about their product. Not too different than a vintner coming down to a restaurant in the city to talk about their varietals. See how I I wrap this all together? See how that works? I know. It's very, very clever. (laughs) Very clever. So, but really, is there is there a a big movement now in California for sun grown cannabis? Do people think there is a difference? Are you guys trying to promote the differences between that or ingra- indoor grown or greenhouse grown? Well, from our perspective, what we're really about is promoting what our farmers do and promoting their farming practices because most of our farmers, if not all practice regenerative farming techniques, which is more than just organic. It's really beyond organic to where you're employing techniques that are improving the quality of your land and your soil um, through every harvest. And so I think that that's a really important piece that under prohibition, individuals really had no idea where their cannabis was coming from or how the person that grew it was treating the land or treating their workers or what their relationship was with the plant. And because of that, we had this very warped idea of what was quality and what was quantity in the market. And under prohibition, quality was really defined as THC percentage, which, you know, going back to wine, it's not like we price wine based on alcohol percentage. Yeah, it's true. So are are you able to convince any of those lovely farmers in the Emerald Triangle to start growing a low THC variety or a mixed CBD THC for those of us like me who are lightweights who want to be able to smoke and get through the whole movie? Yeah, they all do. They all do, Joe. They all do. I mean, we, our farmers are growing a variety of strengths. A lot of them also grow high CBD low THC varieties. And because they are geneticists, in addition to being farmers, they're experimenting with other cannabinoids that we haven't even really seen in a great concentration in the market. So for example, THCV, which is 
kind of like THC, but it doesn't produce as much anxiety as some people report getting with THC. And also it's an appetite suppressant. Yes, I've heard that, that it's the diet cannabinoid, right? This is going to be a big, a big strain. Let me tell you when they get this one going. Oh, absolutely. So one of our farmers grew a high THCV strain um, called Pink Boost Goddess, and it flew off the shelves. And so as consumers are able to have more information about that product, not just the THC percentage, but more about how it was created, we are starting to see more folks shift towards sun grown. And, you know, under prohibition, things were very backwards. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was down in Berkeley not too long ago at a dispensary, and I saw a strain that was grown indoors that was 21% THC, that was $60 an eighth. And then there was another strain that was grown outdoors by a small family farm, and you heard all about the farm, and it was organic, and it was also 21% THC, and it was $35 an eighth. And Why? Well, because Sun Grown has had this weird reputation because quality was based on false information. So people thought sun grown meant that it was just growing in someone's field somewhere and no one was paying attention to it and the THC ah. was really low. And that's not the case. So what you see on the market is actually different than every other market. Because if you're buying produce, the small organic craft produce is always more expensive than the mass produced industrial right. agriculture produce. We're just not there yet with cannabis. So part of what Flocana does is tries to promote what our farmers are doing as being special, as being unique, as being craft. And then that ends up translating to the marketplace where consumers are now asking the question, where was this grown? How was this grown? And THC percentage becomes just one of many different factors that someone's considering in their purchase. So is it like a Tupperware party? If I wanted to have some friends over and talk to a farmer about his sun-grown things, would he come and sort of show his wares and it would be sort of like a Tupperware party, actually? Is this the Tupperware party of today in California? Well, I mean, I think yes and no. Um, you know, there are rules about who can purchase cannabis and who they can purchase it from. Um, so, right, so it's a little bit different. But, um, you know, we are seeing private events all over the place. Um, you know, Flocana does these flow sessions in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles, where we have tastings of our different farms. Uh, we participate in the Emerald Exchange, which is a great program that brings farmers to different um metropolitan hubs around the state and lets the public interact with them and learn about their product. So we're already starting to see this happen. And I think it will continue to happen as consumers start to ask different questions. And you're not at farmer's markets quite yet, are you? Well, that's about, about because of the rules in California. So our rules related to cannabis events state that events can only happen at county fairgrounds. Uh -huh, and okay. so there is a bill that was introduced into the legislature to change that. And I know that the county of Mendocino would love to see some kind of farmer's market or direct to consumer sales, because really that's where the farmers and the winemakers make their money. It's the direct to consumer sales. It's the wine clubs. So we would like to see more of that in California, but it's a process. Amanda, I also read another uh, bit of information that you guys managed to get some gift baskets or gift bags at, into the Oscar ceremony. C can we talk about that a little bit? How did that work? What was the response? Uh, is that why Jimmy Kimmel kept talking about uh, getting high on the show? Well, from what we understand, there are, those jokes were ad-libbed, so we can maybe hypothesize that they were related to the gift bags that folks were receiving backstage. Um, but this was a really great opportunity because really the more mainstream and normalized we can make cannabis, the faster the policies are going to change. Yes. And we may have been successful in places like California and Colorado and Oregon, but you know, places like Kentucky and Nebraska and New York, um, they still have a ways to go. And so they need to see uh, people that they look up to being okay with cannabis. It really is important. And so the Academy Awards is really looked at as this beacon of mainstream celebration of film. 
And so the idea that we were able to be a part of that, that entity um, was very, very important, I think, for the cannabis movement. Of course, the laws in California are very tricky. So we had to really orchestrate um, something that was going to be legal, obviously, because we're a state licensed business. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of rules about personal gifting and how much you're allowed to gift another person. And so we really had to kind of take advantage of those sharing rules in uh, order to pull this off. So what, so what was the gift basket? Tell me what it was. Uh, so it was this beautiful wooden gift box. Um, that had uh, uh, our logo in gold. And then inside, we had some pre-rolled joints and some uh, pre-packaged eighths uh, from different farms. And some of it was higher THC and some of it was high CBD. Um, I believe we also had a little vape pen in there for them. And then we had um, some flow kind of swag, you know, t-shirts and stuff like that. But then we also had information about our farmers and what we do and why we think it's important for the small farmers to be the ones to lead this industry and how, why what they do is so unique and why the region they do it in is so unique. Because we wanted it to be more than just a fun time gift bag, which it absolutely was. We wanted them to really understand so that they can become spokesmen and spokeswomen, perhaps, uh, for the small farmers. Excellent. And what was... Uh what was the response to the gift bag? Can you tell me what a few people might have said or what they did say? Um, you know, I wish I could, but I don't even know. Um, Were you I, there? You weren't there? I was not there. No, I, I, that, was our, that was our Southern California team. Um, but, I mean, I, I have heard that they were the talk of backstage, and I've heard that there were definitely some recipients of the gift bags enjoying them on the docks behind the theater. Um, and, you know, it is legal in California and they were all over 21. So, you know, they're really free to do with it what they wish. Um, you know, we really tried to target celebrities that we knew had a history of being open about cannabis. Uh -huh. um, because, you know, those are the ones that are already talking about it. Um, you know, I mean, Frances McDormand won the Oscar and she was on the cover of High Times. So right, I think, right. you know, there, there's a lot of celebrities that are out there and we really just wanted to help give them ammunition to help us spread the word. Which other ones were are very pro cannabis who were at that show? Do you happen to know offhand? Um, oh, goodness. A lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know the list. I don't have the list. I don't know exactly who they were given to. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's it's cannabis in Hollywood. You know, they, it's, go, it's a, they sort of go hand in hand, don't they? they? They do. And, you know, let's face it. Hollywood represents a group of people with privilege. And when you have privilege, you can get away with a lot, even when things are illegal. So, you know, it's not like cannabis is new to this group. Uh, well, let's, let's change tack a little bit because you're talking about privilege and I, and I think you're right. And I think, I think we all know that if you've been white and middle class cannabis, if you get caught with cannabis, you sort of get a slap on the wrist. But if you happen to be of another color and another class, it might be a little more dangerous. It might be a little more consequential. You might go to jail for a very long time. There was a piece in the New York times the other day. And I'd like to talk to you about it since you have a long history, Dr. Ryman, with, with racial justice and social justice and, and, and all, all substances, really. Um, there was a piece that talked about two different cities, Oakland and I think Compton, and how Oakland is being very welcoming uh, to cannabis entrepreneurs and people with past records were being welcomed to open businesses and dispensaries, whereas in Compton, the community is very opposed here, very opposed. And uh, I profiled two gentlemen, both of whom had records, and the one in Oakland was was doing very well. The one in, in Compton was impo it was impossible for him to get started. Can we talk about that a bit? Absolutely. Um, so so you know, is, this, is this an issue that's close to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was working with Drug Policy Alliance, I mean, we are a racial justice organization, and that is really at the heart of what we do. So when we were looking at Prop 64 for California, 
it was within a racial and social justice lens. I mean, that was really what we were looking at trying to get out of legalization was to prevent people from getting records for cannabis and to help people who had records for cannabis get rid of them. And I think to that extent, we're being very successful. Uh, you know, we're, we are seeing arrests go down for cannabis and we are seeing thousands of people have the ability to clear their records of prior convictions and that's statewide. So it doesn't matter if you're Compton or Oakland or anywhere, you have the ability to have your record cleared. Now that and is so impressive. I, that is an impressive bit of legislation that California so, really, really got behind, I thought. So that was important. Um, but another caveat to that is that when you're writing an initiative and people are going to be voting on it, there's a lot of interests that are tugging at both sides. And one of those areas of tugging involves local control. And when we were looking at Prop 64, you know, we kind of had two choices. We could either say localities can decide to ban cannabis activity, or we could say they can't ban cannabis activity and everyone has to have uh, stores and, and cannabis businesses. The League of Cities uh, would have fought legalization tooth and nail if we had given taken away their local control. And so really, at the end of the day, if we wanted legalization to happen and for people to be able to get their records expunged and for people not to get arrested, we had to give localities the ability to make the decision about whether they wanted cannabis businesses within their borders, which we do with alcohol. It's just it's, that most, so it makes sense to me. I mean, why not, right? Right. So most places allow alcohol, but not everywhere. Um, there's dry counties out there and dry cities and different cities have rules about alcohol outlets and consumption and where it can happen and when. So this is no different. The only difference is there's such a stigma around cannabis that we knew a lot of places were going to ban activity. And that's true. So about 70% of localities in California have banned commercial cannabis activity. Now, do I think that's going to change? Absolutely. Do I think places like Compton within two years are going to have regulations? Absolutely. But right now, when we're in a place where businesses are trying to get off the ground, where there's kind of a race to be first to market, then yes, the people who are in those 30% that have made the decision to regulate have a leg up on the people that are in that 70%. And sometimes people can afford to move from one place to another, but many times they can't. So the folks that are kind of stuck where they are and are in a place that has banned it and really have no choice, they are kind of still living under prohibition, even though they're not subject to criminal penalties the mm. way they were prior. A form of prohibition, I suppose. Who are the folks, say, in Compton who are most opposed? I mean, it's interesting. Compton is a primarily African-American community, am I correct? Yes. Um, and, you know, when we were working on Prop 64, one of the groups that we really did a lot of outreach with because they are not traditionally pro-legalization are the African-American churches and religious groups. And I think that there's a belief about abstinence and sobriety, and there's a belief about um, that cannabis leads to other things. And there's experiences of seeing young men and young people in those communities, you know, not reach potential and kind of drop out because of cannabis, which I would argue is related more to economic experience and cannabis as a tool. But anyway, um, that's, that's another podcast. Um, and so I think that, you know, that that really plays into it. And they're like, we don't want it here the same way they wouldn't want a liquor store and the same way they wouldn't want a strip club and the same way they wouldn't want a casino. And there's this idea that um, because what we've seen with liquor stores, which is absolutely true, that they become concentrated in poor areas and that people feel that that increases the likelihood of alcohol dependence in those areas. There's a concern that if we just allow dispensaries everywhere, that we're going to see them bundled in poorer neighborhoods and they don't want to see that happen. So their answer is just, let's just not have it. Now, you said you think this is going to change. What did you think it's only tax revenue that's going to make it change? Or what do you think is going to actually initiate the change? Uh, well, it will be some will be tax revenue because these localities are not going to be able to collect the same state tax um, as the localities that are regulating. And they're also not going to be able to collect any local tax because they don't have any businesses. So that will be a piece of it. But I think even more than that, it's going to be the way the public changes when they actually see something with their own eyes. 
before they see something with their own eyes, it's really easy to make up stories in your head about what you think is going on. It's harder to do that when you're faced with reality. And so for some of these communities, it's just going to take communities around them having dispensaries and seeing that nothing is happening and that no one cares and it's not a big deal. And so I think, you know, a year from now, they're going to revisit it and they're going to say, okay, so we're missing out on tax revenue. And these businesses don't seem to be doing anything negative to the places they're in. Tell me again why we don't have them here. And then we'll start to see things change. But until people see it with their own eyes, they're making decisions based on a gut feeling. And that's really hard to change, even with facts and figures and data and all that good science stuff. Mm. Amanda, when, when, when we first met, and you mentioned this before, you were at Drug Policy Alliance, which is one of the major organizations fighting for legalization of all drugs, really, but really started with cannabis, I think. It may, certainly made the most progress with that. And you were there for many years doing policy and all sorts of very interesting work. And now you're not doing that. You're at Flocana. Do you miss it? Um, it depends on the day. Uh, you know, I, I, I do miss the environment at Drug Policy Alliance. Um, I really loved the people there. And I loved the way that everyone was so committed to justice. Um, you know, this is really my first private sector job. And even though Flocana is definitely more committed to justice than a lot of cannabis businesses, it's not their primary goal because they're a business. And so it's really the first time I've been working somewhere where social justice and social change was not the primary goal. And so that's really why I took on the job of community relations, because what I've been doing my whole career in cannabis, which is over 15 years now, is going to communities and helping them integrate businesses in a way that makes sense. And so in Mendocino County, you know, they've had these underground cannabis businesses and farmers for decades. And now they're trying to figure out what role do they play in the above ground economy of Mendocino County. And there's a lot of opportunity here, but also a lot of hard feelings um, dashed hopes and dreams on the parts of the small farmers when they're faced with real regulation. Uh, and so it's been a very interesting challenge and not too unlike what I was doing uh, at Drug Policy Alliance, just really focusing on economic justice um, more so than racial justice. Because are, are, very, very <laughs> are those are small farmers and historical growers, are they getting a bum deal? I mean, does it make sense for them to go above ground or are they going to do better off underground? Well, I would never say anyone would do better underground. Um, you know, I, I mean, my advice to anyone is either decide you're going to be a licensed business and go through those steps or decide you don't want to be a licensed business and get a job in the industry, but not as a business owner. Um, because I feel like the, the black market's going to dry up. I mean, this idea that people are still okay with going to someone's living room to buy their cannabis when they don't even really know what it is in it or how strong it is, is going to fade away because no one buys alcohol that way. So, you know, that is going to fade away. And the fact that if you are producing for the illicit market, you have no outlet. So you used to be able to sell that product to a dispensary. You can't do that anymore because they have a license and they don't want to give up their license. So it's going to be harder and harder. Um, that being said, I think the farmers, the small farmers absolutely get a bum deal in California, but I don't think that's because of cannabis. I think it's because food farmers in a state that overtaxes and overregulates their industries, such as California, have a really freaking hard time being successful. And it's the reason that we've seen the disappearance of small traditional family farms in California in general for large industrialized agriculture because we make it too hard for the small farm to survive. And I don't think cannabis is any different, but my hope is that if we can really get the public to stand behind the small organic cannabis farmer, we actually could impact the larger food system and how we look at agriculture as a business in California. I think this could be a catalyst for that larger conversation, which I think would be amazing. Cannabis as a catalyst of the conversation to talk about big ag versus small farms. Very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very interesting. You know, people, the thing, interesting thing about cannabis is it has so many different touch points, politics, social justice, economics, agriculture, obviously that it, it, it seems like a small thing, but I think at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a touch point for so many different issues. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about, you know, environmental justice, racial justice, uh, women's issues. So, you know, the cannabis industry used to be a place that had way more women in it than other industries. That is starting to change, which is very dismaying. Um, I'm working with a partner on creating a accelerator and incubator for female owned cannabis businesses. What's that called? Um, it's called the initiative. Wow. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I'll okay. talk about it. On, I'll have me back. Have, have my partner. That's, my back. A deal. Sure. That's a deal. You'll come back. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much for joining me today. You are a fascinating interview and I always love talking to you. Thank you, Dr. Oh, Amanda well. Ryman. My pleasure. Anytime. We always love hearing from all of our listeners. And if you guys have questions, we're happy to answer them. You can always contact Joe or myself at bravenewweedcast at gmail.com. Thanks, Amanda. Always great to hear from you. You know, Matthew, I want to tell you about a product I came across lately, uh, recently when I was in California. It's, they're called Satori Chocolates. S-A-T-O-R-I. Now, these are really a clever product. First of all, they're delicious. They taste fantastic. And they're pretty low dose. They mm -hmm. have different doses. One milligram THC, three, five, I think eight, and ten. But what's really clever is they change the inside of the, of the sweet to reflect what the dosage is. So you always know what you're about to take. Not only did they change the inside of the sweet, but they change the size of them. Hmm. So if it's a one milligram, it's a small bit. If it's a 10 milligram, it's slightly larger. And you always, this is important because it's yeah. really hard to know what you're going to take because one piece of chocolate really looks like another piece of chocolate, right. doesn't it? Right. We, we've really harped on this for a long time when it comes to edibles and, and really any kind of thing. I just recently uh, obtained some, some new vaporization tanks that are uh, just, it's like a shot in the dark. There's no markings on how much you're getting. There's no indication as to what's inside of it. Uh, it you don't know if, uh, I think it was Warren Bobro that was like talking about a guy mixing it. He's been smoking all day. He's like not sure if he's added the pot yet or not. Yes, uh, exactly. And it, it's just this sort of. It's just, too cavalier. It's just, it just doesn't work in the post-prohibition era. We want to know what we're taking. Well, in, in anything else too, especially if you're talking about medical or anything of that nature, you're like, these doses are strategically designed and measured for a specific purpose. Yeah. And if that's the way we're going to go, I mean, it's the same sort of thing with like, you, you want that if you're going to have a beer. You want to know if you're drinking a 4.3% alcohol beer or a 9.2 alcohol beer. Of course you do. Uh, because you don't want to get yourself in a situation that you're no longer in control of. So I've been experimenting with the scale of, okay, what is a one milligram? What does it feel like? So one milligram really almost feels like nothing. I think you could maybe just have a slightly better day. But three milligrams, I think, will turn a smirk into a smile. I think five milligrams is maybe an enhancement, a very pleasant enhancement. I think seven is you're feeling buzzed. Oh, yeah. I would agree with that. And 10, you're, you're maybe high. Now, this, of course, varies on, on how much tolerance you have. I've kept my tolerance quite low lately. So, you know, I'll take a five and have a very pleasant evening. Well, and I tend to, uh, in, in my consumption, depending on what activities I'm getting into or what time of day it is, like if I know I'm going to be out in the garden for a couple of hours and it's, you know, later in the afternoon to where my day is sort of coming to its close, then yeah, I don't mind something around a five or a seven milligram dose. Yeah. Uh, if I'm waking up in the morning and I know I have to do some running around and run a bunch of errands, I definitely uh, don't want to take a seven milligram well, or you even a try 10 a milligram or at the day. Try a one. Uh, and I'm really curious about uh, what we have here because this is actually three milligram doses of CBD with 0.3 milligrams of TH. Oh, you're talking about this new product they've got. Yeah, this is I'm, the new CBD. So, so the point of that is if you add a tiny bit of THC, you amplify the effects of CBD. Right. So if you're using... Wakes up the receptor. It does a little bit more. So if you're using... Um, like say you're using CBD for stress and you don't want a lot of psychoactivity, you want any psychoactivity. This is a, an interesting formulation. I don't know if it works, I've never tried it. So that means, look, if you took three of these three milligram CBDs, you're gonna get nine milligrams of CBD and 0.9 milligrams of THC. Those are both very low dosages. It should be very reasonable for anybody. Most people take 10, 10 to 15 milligrams of CBD. So you would be taking 
four or five of these little candies, and that would give you about 1.5 milligrams of THC, which is still not going to cause psychoactivity in most people unless you're extremely what's now known as cannabis naive. Yeah, I mean, it seems as though you could probably fairly eat half of this box well, and and survive it. I mean, it's only 14 you could milligrams You easily box. survive it. And, and then that gets you up to a very high dosage of like 70 milligrams of CBD. But I think what's interesting about this company is that they're really exploring microdosing. They're really exploring these smaller amounts of THC, which I think is, is the way the conversation, if you're not in the recreational market full on, if you're not smoking, you know, an eighth a day or something like that. Yeah. I think this is a very interesting and important development for the way things are I, I think it's fantastic on a lot of levels, even for people who, like I, like I said, I know that that's quite a big leap to say, like, I'm going to eat half the box, but it's about the size of a bag of M&Ms. And so psychologically speaking, I'm sort of just like, yeah, I, I, I don't want to eat one tiny milk chocolate. I'm into that, a small handful of them. Well, you're and so we're a, getting closer. You're going to spend a little more money then. We're getting closer to that as a, a reality, though, to where your whole purchase of a single experience of maybe 10 milligrams of THC comes in a full bag of M&Ms that you can actually enjoy the snack Absolutely. and have your little extra on top. So try these. They're called Satori. And we'll, we'll tweet. We'll take a picture. Uh, visit our Instagram. We'll put a picture of the package yeah. up there. They're very nice. The packaging is good. And uh, I think you can get them all over. I know you can get them all over California. And I think they're about to go into Colorado as well. Excellent. Folks, thanks again for listening to the Brave New Weed podcast. Uh, please don't forget that if you like this, please share it widely. And please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. And it will really go a long way to continuing the post-prohibitionist conversation. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at brave new weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash brave new weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com.